Hi, I'm Krista Jacobson, headmistress of the Buddha Dukai, where we teach authentic ninjutsu and classical samurai bujutsu. And for those of you who don't know what that is, those are the ancient martial arts of the ninja and samurai. Tonight I'm going on one of my night walks again and I'm going to share some of my thoughts in the martial arts with all of you. And tonight's topic is going to be on kumite or sparring and the importance of having randori in your martial arts training. Um, before we begin, I just want to say that if you guys are interested in authentic ninjutsu and classical samurai bujutsu, or just Japanese martial arts in general, um, reality-based self-defense, survival videos, martial arts philosophy, martial arts discussion, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell because if you click the bell then you'll get the notifications and you'll be able to see all the videos that I post. I do try to post about two to three videos a week um, and I'm very active on YouTube so if you guys are interested and in martial arts um, yeah please subscribe to the channel and keep up with what we're doing so here we go right so the discussion of kumite or sparring is one of those things where people are either very for it or very against it it's like you have all these schools like well we don't spar because our martial arts too deadly right so we can't do sparring we can't do kickboxing or MMA or whatever that is right uh, sport martial arts and then on the other side, you have people that just, that's all they ever do. They like, we don't do traditional kata. We don't do forms or techniques or, you know, that traditional stuff doesn't work in the modern day. So we don't do any of that. All we do is spar. Well, in this particular video, I'm going to kind of explore both sides of that coin and uh, kind of call bullshit where bullshit needs to be called, right? Um, because there's a lot of people that... They, they just kind of talk out their ass and they're saying things that they've heard before that's been perpetuated in the martial arts community and it's just just wrong. There's just no other way. It's factually wrong. It doesn't, it's an opinion, it's an old tale that people just tend to perpetuate and they keep it going and it's not backed up by anything. So what I want to discuss today is not only call bullshit where bullshit needs to be called, but I also want to tell you guys what the essence is, why sparring why it's in the curriculum, why you need to spar. Um, and what's the word I'm looking for? It's not just why you need to spar, but what's its purpose? What is the essence? Because a lot of people don't even know. Everyone just tends to think, well, if I spar, I'm going to be a better fighter. If I spar, I'm going to be better at self-defense. And it's not necessarily true. Even if you're really, really good at sparring, that doesn't mean you're going to be good at self-defense. Because they don't equate to the same thing. And so today, uh, since we had did a lot of sparring in the dojo tonight, uh, I thought I would share some of my thoughts with you guys on this subject as I went out for a little night walk. It's a beautiful night tonight. It's been raining all week. So this is like the first time I can get out and go for my little walk and clear my head and share some thoughts with you guys, right? So what I'm going to do to start this, uh, first of all, we have five different areas of sparring in our school. Um, and, and the Buddha Yukai. And um, in my organization, uh, it's broken into those sections. And I want to start with that so you guys can see where we're coming from and what we do. And not everyone does the same thing. Everyone has different ways about it. Different arts have different approaches and so on and so forth. But the first, uh, and these aren't really in any order per se, but these are the five. So the first one, we, we call them position drills. And that's where you have two, uh, two students are going to grab on each other, kind of like in a grappling situation. And uh, they are on their knees. We usually let beginners do this one, to be honest, because it helps them understand how to, to feel the force of someone trying to roll them over. So in a way, it's very similar to kind of like a wrestling match, yeah, kind of, but not really. It's not even like that. It's the who can get on top, who can get in the better position. So there's no chokes and locks. There's no strikes. It's who can push and pull the other person and, and get on top. And that's why we call it a positioning drill, because who can get to the better position? And in all honesty, we really don't do that one very much. Uh, we, do that in the very, we do that in the very beginning to get people um, introduced to the idea of someone grabbing them and kind of rolling them to the ground. And the reason we're on the knees is, again, because we usually do that with beginners. And you know, they don't have to take those hard falls to the ground like if we're doing nagewaza or something like that. But um, that is an area of randori where you got one person trying to beat the other person. And uh, randori is like chaos talking, right? Or this idea where it's, it's not like kata, because kata is a form. And you, you, you know, you know, one, two, three, you understand the attack and you understand what you're going to do versus the attack. And, and generally speaking, the uke already knows what you're going to do as well. So when, kata itself, although I'm a firm believer in kata, and, I'm, I'm, I, and I think kata is wonderful and it, and it holds so many not just 
technical skills, but historical skills and lessons and secrets of the martial arts. I'm really big on kata, but um, that's not what this video is for. We're talking about sparring. When you're doing kata, though, it is pre, it is to the to the point, for the lack of a better word, prearranged. Both people both understand what's going on. We're in randori, or you're doing like going against another person. They don't know what the other person's going to do, and you're trying to defeat the other one within some sort of context of rules. And that's what we mean why we why I always say it's realistic self-defense because you can train in a realistic manner, but that doesn't make it real. And people get that mixed up too. Um, if you were really going to do it, you'd gouge their eyes, you'd bite them, you'd claw them, you'd pull their hair. That's really, that's really doing the technique. Realistic is doing things that would realistically work in a realistic situation. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm, I'm very against pe the whole idea of doing spinning back kicks and jump kicks and spinning this, that, and the other. I'm not really for that. I don't see a purpose in turning your back to your opponent. You know what I mean? There are a lot of people that are very, obviously you watch the martial arts, there's a lot of people that, that love that kind of stuff. And it is what it is, you know what I mean? It's just, it's not, it's not here. Do we have spin kicks and, and, and you know, um, you know, kaiten giri and things like that in the curriculum? Yeah, we do, uh, you know, I mean, it, ha it, it does have its place, but I'd be the first one to say, you know, it's in there, but it's not one that I'd be doing in a realistic situation. You know what I mean? There's lots of things in the kata that I don't think need to be utilized in a realistic situation. I think sometimes there are techniques that are put in the curriculum to help better footwork and timing and, and balance and control and so on and so forth, right? But, anyway, let's get back to sparring. So I go on, I can go on about that one. So let's get back to sparring. So the first, the first sparring, number one out of the five that we have, is the positioning drills. Like I said, that's usually for our beginners who've never sparred ever. They have zero sparring experience. They've never been in a fight or whatever. That's usually the first place we start introducing to that. No punches, no kicks. And then that goes into the next areas. And then we have a temiwaza, which is striking. It kind of looks like a kickboxing match. Punches and kicks and so on and so forth. Various strikes. Um, we do full contact, so we do hit to the, I do allow you know strikes to the head. Um, and we do kick to the legs as well. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, we don't let people kick each other in their knees, of course, but you know, kick them in the thighs or whatnot, you know, that's, that's fine as well. So, you know, we do, you know, I would say it would be any very similar to what you'd see in a in a UFC match that where they were just doing strikes. So I'd say it looks, you know, it looks like that, those type of rules, punches, kicks, that sort of thing. The second thing, the second one we're going to have is Nagewaza drills, and that's where you're in a clinched position. This time you're standing, and you're throwing each other to the floor. Who can get the throws? We do have a lot of Nagewaza within our curriculum, and I want my students to test their skills. Who can get a throw on each other? So, and, and, and again, I'm using kind of analogies so you, the viewer, can understand where I'm coming from. So that one kind of looks more like a like a UFC match. You know what I mean? Uh, not a UFC, excuse me, a judo match, where someone's trying to throw the other person. Generally, we don't add strikes to that. Sometimes I do allow them to strike to kind of kind of get them off balance and, and, and so on and so forth. But generally speaking, when we're doing just straight nagewaza, they do nagewaza. Um, the fourth one that we have is called kumuch. And kumuch is uh, grappling. Like now they're on their, they, sometimes we start standing up and take a throw to the ground or something. But generally speaking, they start on their knees and they use that quote unquote positioning drill to get to position. Um, but it, it's basically, it's, it's ground fighting, submission fighting, something that you would see. Again, I'm using the UFC as an example, but like grappling, submission, ground fighting, you're looking for a lock, a choke, something like that. And again, sometimes we add striking to that, sometimes we don't. Then we have what we call kumite, and kumite is when we put it all together. So we allow the students, you know, one person's on one side, one person's on the other, and then I'll say, you know, you know, bow, you know, fighting position, kumite. And that's where they have, you know, the punches, the kicks, um, and then they take the punches and kicks to the grappling position, then they can go to a throw, the throw goes to the, gra the ground, obviously hit the ground, you're gonna need those positioning drill skills to get to a certain position, and then from there you're gonna work whether your chokes, your submissions, and so on and so forth. So those are our five basic areas of uh, randori in our, in the Buddha Dukai. Now each of those five sections does have variations to it. Those aren't just, I just gave you the basic understanding of them. Positioning drills, you know, which kind of looks like a wrestling match. Um, a temi waza, which is, looks like a kickboxing match. Nage waza looks like a judo match, you know. Um, your 
uh, Kumuch looks like a grappling match, like a UFC submission fighting match. And then, um, then you have your uh, Kumite, which is where you put it all together. Actually, Kumite probably looks a little bit more like UFC, um, to be quite honest with you, because you see in the, U the M MMA people punching, kicking, throws, takedowns, grappling, that kind of thing. So I guess in all reality, the Kumiuch looks more like someone doing submission grappling and in our school. And then um, the Kumite is all, all of it. Now, the variations to it. I'm big on multiple attackers. I'm big on weapons. I think that they should be doing all those things. You know, like when we do the you know, Kumite, one on two, one on three, uh, one has a weapon. Maybe you have a weapon and they don't. Maybe all of them have weapons and you don't have one. Um, you know, we, we there's so many different variations that we that we have in our training with that. And right at this point, you're probably asking yourself, well, shit, you base everything, a lot of your training on realistic self-defense, why do you spar so much when you say sparring doesn't necessarily help you in self-defense? And I know that's that's the big mind fuck, isn't it? Because it's absolutely true. Sparring doesn't necessarily help you in self-defense. And yes, we pride ourselves on our Goshin Jutsu or, or our reality-based self-defense training. What self-defense offers, or not self-defense, excuse me, what sparring offers is it gives you the opportunity to test your skills against someone who's trying to beat you in a situation that you do not, cannot control, very similar to kata like we talked about in the beginning. A lot of times people tend to think that, well, if I spar, I'm gonna be a better, better at self-defense. It's not true. See, the thing is, when you're doing self-defense, you're going to your car, um, you know, you're, you're, you're at a gas station, you're going to your car or whatever, someone jumps you, they automatically have a huge advantage. No one, the, I've already said this a million times, the rabbit don't attack the lion. And what that means is, if someone comes after you, you're the prey. So there is no, when we spar, you're sparring with your, you know, your friend or whatever in the dojo. But the reality of the situation is when you're sparring or when people do like sport competition, we're not a sport school. We have sparring slash kumite slash randori in our training, right? But we're not a sport school. And, um, and I will say that I don't think sparring has to have any more weight to it than any other aspect of training um, you know I think there are other areas of martial arts training that are way more important than you know grappling around and rolling around on the ground with someone just simply because you know that you're not someone puts a gun to your head or a knife on your throat you're not pulling guard at a fucking gas station you know and, I, and granted I probably piss a lot of Brazilian jiu-jitsu people off for saying that but there's no fucking way someone comes in puts a knife on your throat you know give me your wallet and then you pull guard it's just not that's not, there's no way anyone can convince me that that's like real. People really do it, but you can't convince me that that would be an appropriate reaction to that particular attack. Anyway, my point is, when you are doing it, there is a benefit of being able to control yourself in that situation, right? That's why you spar. Because a lot of people, when they have to go up against another person, it gets physical and someone starts pushing you around, they start to beat you a little bit, and you start feeling pain, your anxiety goes up, your fear goes up, the stress levels go up, all that kind of stuff. When that happens, that's the point where you have to control your mind. You gotta control your emotions. You gotta control your technique to think, outthink, devise a strategy, and defeat the person in front of you. That is why it's so good. It's not the actual moves that you're doing because, like I said, no one's gonna pull fucking guard with a knife on their throat. This is stupid. But the benefit of being able to control yourself in an intense situation where both people are slugging it out, that is something that you do not get in kata. Because you already know it's a prearranged. You're not gonna get all stressed out because someone does an attack that you know they're gonna do and you've already learned the response to that particular attack. So that's why it's so important that you add that within your, you, you factor that in with your training. That's why it's so important. Now, on the on, on a backside to this, I do want to say a few things before we, we get to this point. When you're doing the sparring and you're trying to control your mind, you're trying to control your technique, you want to think of it, you want to think of sparring just like you would think of any other type of thing that you would do to better your skills, whether it's strength training or 
um, cardiovascular conditioning or flexibility training or you know bag work or working on whatever it is that you're doing that's that would that kind of falls underneath hojo and do or supplemental training it's just as important as all the rest of them but it's not more important I mean the art itself learning the tradition learning the kata learning the waza you know creating the skill sets the mentality that is what's gonna save your ass but the supplemental training is needed to create friction right so and that friction itself will then establish you can sharpen the sword I mean how do you how do you create a sword right you take a lump of steel and you heat it up and you beat it into shape and then once you've heated it up and you've beat it into shape now you got to put an edge on it how do you put an edge on it by friction and through that friction now you've sharpened the sword that's the same way you should approach your martial arts training now when you do sparring compared to self-defense technique when you see two people sparring whether it's a grappling match or a kickboxing match or kumite karate competition taekwondo judo whatever you have two people they both go in knowing that they're going to go into a match there's a weight class there are rules and one is one is going to try to outdo the other with a specific set of rules automatically that does not define self-defense self-defense is when someone is coming after you and they have a huge advantage most people are trying to they want to kill you they want to take your your wallet they want to steal your car they want to they it, it's it's not hey I beat you up I had the first one of five points it, that's not what it's about it's something way more horrific than that so and you're at a disadvantage because the person that's coming after you on the street they got a knife they've got edged weapons they've got firearms they've got multiple attackers they know the terrain better than you I mean predators tend to sit there and wait for prey to come by and then they come after them it's just like reading the river I've said this a million I've said this a lot when you look at predators it's almost like you're going fishing right well if you notice all the little fish are always in one area and they're usually going with the flow of the stream the big fish are never in the flow of the stream because they're trying to save and conserve their energy and what they're doing is they've kind of tucked away to a certain section to conserve energy and wait for the wait for the prey to go by so they can snap them predators do the same thing here you know what they do is they're never in the flow of where you know like you see all the perch and all the bluegill and all the fish going through the stream and all that kind of stuff we see those we never see the big fish that eat them because they're tucked away somewhere outside of that normal stream and they know those spots it's almost like the fish even understand the hierarchy within themselves and their own species if you will attackers on the street is the same they're never gonna walk they're generally gonna walk on the sidewalks and and be around where other people are around and, and you know that, that's not what they're going to do they're gonna hide in the shadows they're gonna be tucked away a little bit they're gonna look for prey and then they attack and when they attack they have a huge advantage they're gonna have a tactical advantage again whether it's firearms or edged weapons or multiple attackers they know the terrain better than you hell they've probably already uh, devised a, an exit strategy you know and, and, and we're just talking about one-on-one -on -one conflict we're not talking about you know mass situations where you have really you know really bad people trying to do a lot of harm to groups of people but when you look at that situation nothing that I just said symbolizes a sparring match so for someone to say you got to be really good at kickboxing to be a really good at self-defense that's just not accurate in any way at all it, it's absolutely not accurate so on one hand yes I think sparring is an essential aspect to martial arts training and I think everyone should be sparring I think everyone should do this the, the kickboxing rounds and the grappling rounds and and then put the striking to throws and takedowns and and I, I and and do you know empty-handed versus weaponry and empty hand one versus two and I think all those drills are great because they damn because they develop they help develop specific skills that you can't get in the kata you know even even if you know the confidence and the and the neurological response and the fast twitch muscle fibers that you build through that sparring right those are those are great skills those are great reaction time and you also learn a lot about yourself the footwork the timing and all this kind of stuff those are all great things but all those things that you're building doesn't necessarily fit that situation with you bending over the back of a, of a car putting your you know putting your groceries away and someone walks up behind you and you know has a weapon and says you know give me your purse give me your wallet give me your car 
You know, in a lot of situations, you just, you know, do what you, you tell them, give them what they want. You know, I mean, if you're putting your, putting your bags of groceries in your car and someone walks up and puts a fucking uh, gun on you or a firearm or whatever and they say, give me your, give me your car. Well, that's what you got insurance for, right? So here's my keys. Go on with it. Right? But if my kid's in the back of the car, well, now we got a problem. You ain't getting the damn car. And that's what I mean by sometimes it's, it's always about... It's situational awareness too, and when you're when you're already faced with a disadvantage, you're already faced with a disadvantage. That's one reason why. Another reason why is in a self-defense situation, one person has the mentality where they've already picked you out as prey, and they are going to attack you with something. You don't know the attack's coming for one, and then once the attack happens, you're more primarily concerned with trying to protect yourself and not get hurt, um, rather than just mentally going after someone and beating them up, kind of thing, you know. Which again, that's exactly ass backwards or quite different than what you see in a sparring match. So, when you're training in martial arts, there are three things that you have to have in your training. You have to have these three things. If you don't have these three things, then there's no way you're training for these three things. You have to implement these three things. And I can say that all three things are implemented in the Budo Ryukai curriculum, whether it's in one of our dojos or even in the online ninjutsu dojo, if you're studying through the online means. You have to factor in some, some form of fear. You have to factor in some form of uh, stress or anxiety. And you have to factor in pain. And pain is the biggest indicator. Pain is the number one thing that has to be in the curriculum. It has to. If you are not training constantly with dealing with pain, enduring pain, or giving pain, you are simply not dealing with pain. And the first thing that's going to happen in a real life situation, in a realistic self-defense scenario, is you're going to have to deal with pain. We always talk about this situation where someone walks up and they put a knife or a gun and they say, hey, give me your wallet, give me your purse, give me your car. Well, it's all well and good. But a lot of them don't even do that. They just walk up and just stab someone. They just walk up and hit someone. They just walk up and, and, and they, they, they assault somebody. And then when they do that, right, then at that point you've already felt pain and you didn't even know it was coming. You have to be able to endure that pain that quickly, flip a switch, and then protect yourself. And if, you're not, if you don't have pain in the curriculum, if you're not pushing yourself through pain, then you're not pushing yourself through pain. In our school, if you have a problem with physical conditioning, physical fitness, bag work, then this isn't gonna be an organization that you're gonna stick with because we constantly push that envelope all the time. I want my students to have to learn how to deal with pain. So it's like, okay, level one, you got this many, this is your push-up, sit-up, squats, etc. All right, level two, you got more. Level three, you got more. Level five, you got more. Every time, more bag work, more this, more this. You have to do that because it's one of those things where it's not necessary. And again, does all that necessarily fit in a realistic you know, self-defense situation? No, it doesn't. What it does, it pushes them to an extreme and lets them understand where their levels are so that they can say, okay, I can take this much pain and I can still do it. It's an opportunity for them to shine. It's an opportunity for them to say, damn, look what I just fucking did. This crazy ass woman in Kansas City, she has me doing these many push-ups and sit-ups and squats and jump lunges and all this bag work and all the sparring and I think she's fucking nuts. But I took the test and I didn't think I was gonna do it, but I fucking did it. And then they and then they, you could see it in their face or like they, they feel like they totally accomplished something because they did. They did something more than they thought they'd ever fucking do in their life. Everybody's ever taken a black belt test. It, it's like, it's the hardest fucking thing I've ever done. Like, yeah. And it should be, you know, it should be. It should make you feel like you just faced that and, and you prevailed and it gives you that sense of like, God damn, but it, need, but it should be testing for black belt and testing for this and pushing yourself to extremes and dealing with fear and anxiety and stress. All those things should be factored in. And one of those things, one of the many things is kumite, is sparring. Sparring, generally speaking, it helps the students deal with stress, Anxiety, fear. That's generally what it helps them deal with. Because if, if they, because a lot of times people go into sparring and they get really nervous and they don't want to spar and stomach starts going at it and like 
you know, oh my God, and this person's bigger than me, and this person has more, um, you know, more technique, or this person's, you know, you know, and in our school, I said, we don't really, I don't differentiate between the belts. A white belt can spar a black belt, I don't care. <clears throat> we don't differentiate with gender. The girls spar the guys, you know. <clears throat> I mean, I don't put people up against each other that, you know, it isn't gonna benefit either one. I mean, I want someone that's a black belt sparring a white belt, and the black belt doesn't get a workout either. I mean, I mean, if there's only two in class, I guess that's just how it is, I guess. But, you know, generally speaking, you try to pair people up that's gonna push each other and, and, and give them both a good workout and so forth, but we don't differentiate between it. There's lots of times we'll get people to come into class and they, um, you know, they are white belts or yellow belts or something, but they've had years of martial art experience before they've seen me. So it's not a problem for them to go up against someone with more experience in this organization, because just because they're in the organization longer doesn't mean they have more experience. So I, that's why we don't really differenti differentiate with the rank so much. Now, um, this also leads up to why we do so many, you know, I do two workshops a month. We have daikomio size and, 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 the, and the taikais and all that stuff every, every, you know, three times a year because we have the online dojo. We have people coming in and we give them the opportunity to test those skills and, and sharpen that sword. And then when they leave, they just hone that blade. You know, they keep that edge. And they do it through the physical conditioning and the bag work and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, even professional athletes who are professional fighters in the UFC and boxing, they don't spar 100% spar every fucking day. Their bodies can't handle it. You do it in a, in a systematic way that you could benefit and, and, and help your body understand how to do the sparring and how to do certain things and so on and so forth. So with all of this stuff, the people that's like, Here's, here's, here's my outro before I let you guys go, right? For the people that's like, well, we don't spar because, you know, our techniques are just so much deadlier than everybody else's. Bullshit. Because if you're going to sit there and tell me that you have zero control, that if you do your martial arts that's so fucking deadly, the only thing you're going to do is kill somebody, well, you're not a very good martial artist because you should have better control than that. So I call bullshit to that group. The other group that's like, well, all we do is spar and, you know, we grapple, full contact, MMA, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's bullshit too. Because if you think that's what's going to help you in self-defense, I can promise you that if someone puts a knife on your throat and you pull guard, you're going to die. If someone has a gun to your head, you're going to do a double leg takedown. You're going to fucking die. I mean, that does not help the big picture, right? Sparring is good. Sparring and, or kumite, uh, randori drills, um, you know, unfixed scenarios. All those things are wonderful, and they should be placed within the training. But they need to be placed in the training and given the weight that they deserve. If you're training in whatever yuha you're learning, whatever tradition, whatever that is, you know, um, that's what the importance is, learning the kata, understand the philosophy and the strategies and the principles, being able to apply the technique, having the mental courage and, um, and warrior you know, fortitude to be able to go through and, and push yourself through that pain. There isn't one component that's going to be better than the other. Sparring uh, or kumite is an aspect of hojo and do. It's not hojo and do. So like with us, we have the five areas of training. So you have your traditional skills and, and your modern applications and your self-defense techniques and you have to study the scrolls and you got to study the densho and you got seshi teki kyoyo, which is spiritual refinement. You got all these things that you got to study so you can understand the martial arts. None of that has to do with sparring. Then you have that one section of training, which is hojo and do, and that's you know strength training and cardio training and skin and bone conditioning and Sparring. Sparring is a section of Hojo and Do. And it needs to it doesn't need to be any more important than any other section of Hojo and Do. But it is a section that you can't that you should have in your training. So um, tonight my students were really busting their ass tonight and they're you know they were sparring hard and we did kickboxing rounds and um, but worked at, primarily tonight was this kickboxing or, or kempo kempo uh, technique and um, now everyone sparred hard and everyone did great and you know, very proud of the students that fought. They all fought hard and they showed good warrior spirit. And, and I tell them all the same thing. And some of them get down because they don't do so well. And I just tell them all the same thing. It's like, shit, my record's 50-50. You know, half my students always win, half my students are always going to lose. So, you know, my job is to help as much as I can and, and point them in the right direction and help them grow as martial artists. And, um, you know, everyone did good tonight. And because of their warrior spirit and because everyone did so well, I thought I would share some of my thoughts and share that with you guys. I don't know what you guys learned, you know, but um, 
it's my thoughts for the night. So anyway, uh, if you guys are interested in authentic ninjutsu and classical samurai bujutsu, and you guys are interested in my methods of training, uh, please check out the website at www.budodoninjutsu.com. There you can see a list of our schools. If you don't live next to one of our schools, we do offer the online ninjutsu dojo, and you can train uh, that way with us. So again, it's www.budodoninjutsu.com. So thank you guys very much for your love and support. I will talk to all of you guys later. Bye.